parts of China see increased security presence, armed police patrolling 24 hours a day. Many wonder why. China's official unemployment figure is raising doubts as the economy hit hard by the pandemic. A new analysis in China says it should be three times higher. The World Health Organization representative in China saying the Chinese regime refusing to allow the WHO to investigate the origins of the virus. A Chinese student falling for the Communist Party's propaganda flew home to avoid the virus outbreak. What happened later devastated him. And the pandemic highlighting America's reliance on China for medical supplies. Today, we take a look at the turning point on how China became the manufacturing hub it is today. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Over 100 policemen armed with submachine guns and over 20 armored vehicles have started patrolling a city 120 miles northwest of Beijing 24 hours a day. Authorities say they're fighting street crime. But the city hasn't had any serious crimes or terrorist attacks that would justify such a presence. Some netizens believe that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to stop people from rioting. Chinese citizens' dissatisfaction with authorities is growing. One netizen wrote, it's a shameless regime. The people under its rule live like pigs, and the rulers are still always afraid they'll rebel. It just shows they aren't able to govern the country and know they have no right to do it either. It's hard for people from Hubei and Heilongjiang to find a job in other places. Many outsiders believe the virus situation in these two provinces is still very serious. Our reporter called a factory in another province and discovered that most factories there are refusing all job applicants from the two provinces. She said other factories have the same rule. How high is the unemployment rate in China? Li Xunlei, director of a financial research institute in China, published an article on April 26 saying China's actual unemployment rate is about 20 percent, with 70 million people recently becoming unemployed. He's also hinted that China's official unemployment rate for March may be wrong. It was 5.9 percent, only 0.7 percent higher than last year. He says it doesn't tally with other economic numbers, which have dropped sharply. On April 30th, he was removed from his role as director of the institute, but remained as chief economist. The institute denied the removal had anything to do with his article, saying Li wanted to concentrate on research and removed himself. On the same day, Li issued a statement saying he didn't write the article himself. It was just published on his account. He said he later chose to withdraw the article. Adding rumors like he was summoned by police and was forced to delete the article are pure nonsense. China imports much of its grain, but because of the global pandemic, many countries have restricted exports, including rice and oil. This week, Chinese authorities issued a notice on the urgency of growing domestic grain and combating pests, including locusts and a kind of moth. And Heilongjiang province is facing another danger. Continuous heavy snowfall has waterlogged farmland since mid-April. Farmers can do nothing but watch as their crop yield falls or even fails. This video shows tens of thousands of acres flooded by rain and snow. The person taking the video says one area is corn, another is soybeans. Soybeans are all over, rice, soybeans, corn, all reduced. Bloomberg reported on Thursday that President Trump is considering blocking a government retirement fund from investing in Chinese stocks. Fifty billion dollars is set to go to the Chinese companies, but Trump may sign an executive order to stop it. The Chinese yuan crashed dramatically on the news. Trump said this week the U.S. has many ways to make China pay for withholding information on the epidemic. Earlier this week, he said the government didn't know how much compensation it would seek for the outbreak, but said it would be significantly more than the $160 billion suggested by German media. 
China has refused to let the WHO investigate the origin of the virus. That's according to the WHO's representative in China. He told Sky News on Friday that China is conducting its own investigation, but the WHO has not been invited to join. This comes amid growing global dispute over the virus's origins and how China handled the outbreak. Now to Italy. According to local media, Italy's hardest-hit region, Lombardy, is joining a growing list of entities suing the Chinese regime for damages caused by the virus. Italian politician and head of Lombardy League Paolo Grimaldi is calling for over $20 billion from Beijing for damages to the region. May 1st marked over 76,000 confirmed cases and over 14,000 deaths for the region. Three members of parliament from Veneto region are also urging the governor to seek over $20 billion compensation from the Chinese regime. They say Veneto will see a 7 percent drop in GDP due to the outbreak. The first Italian lawsuit came on April 20th. A hotel sued the Chinese health ministry for not promptly reporting the virus, which decimated the ski season and resulted in economic loss for the hotel. The second suit came from Italian consumer rights organization. On April 24th, it filed a complaint against the World Health Organization. The German chancellor and two ministers have already appealed to the Chinese regime for more transparency. Now Germany's Free Democratic Party is urging China to allow an independent international investigation into the origins of the virus. A recent op-ed in the French Le Point magazine says it's not a Chinese virus, it's a communist virus. It's the latest call to differentiate the Chinese people from the virus and the communist regime. The Food and Drug Administration has granted emergency use authorization for Gilead's remdesivir drug to treat the coronavirus, President Trump announced Friday. Top infectious disease expert Dr. Anthony Fauci said on Wednesday. The data shows that remdesivir has a clear-cut significant positive effect in diminishing the time to recovery. This is really quite important. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID, released a separate statement showing preliminary results. According to the data, 31 percent of patients recovered faster than those taking the placebo. Gilead Sciences released a smaller study on Wednesday showing similar improvements for both 5- and 10-day treatments. Gilead Sciences says it will submit its findings to be peer-reviewed. NIAID is set to release the federal trial data in the coming days. A young Chinese student returned home after seeing the communist regime's propaganda. From there, his life took a drastic turn. NTD's Juliet Song has the story. A Wuhan student studying in Italy flew home to escape the CCP virus outbreak there. After landing in Shanghai, he tested positive. Worse still, hotel staff where he stayed in quarantine destroyed his belongings, including cash and his official ID. He's devastated. But I can't go back to Italy without my passport. Also, all the official documents I need for school are there as well. I can't return to school without them. The student suspects he was infected on his flight. The day he tested positive, he was directed to a hospital for treatment. He questioned the staff after discovering his quarantine hotel had disinfected his room and destroyed his things. You destroyed all of my belongings. Things like this don't happen in this day and age. And you didn't even call me to ask. The hotel refused to compensate him. The student later wrote a long post on social media to defend his rights. His story went viral after the media picked it up, attracting over 260 million views. Netizens discovered he's a nationalistic internet troll. Typically called Little Pinks, they defend the ruling Communist Party against all criticism. In a post about protests in Hong Kong last year, he wrote, I'm so upset reading news about those Hong Kong protesters every day. Go lick the feet of your American dad. Do you think you're American? Expressing demands? What demands? Can't you express it in a nice manner? Not only do you throw away the Chinese national flag, you insult and beat people. A bunch of dogs. Hashtag Hong Kong protests sit in the airport obstructing traffic. Right after he returned home, he published a post on social media. I just landed in Shanghai. I cried. 
I dared not to eat or drink anything on my way back, but since the airplane landed, my heart settled. A China affairs commentator says the student is a victim of the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda. He believed Chinese Communist Party's propaganda, thinking the situation in China is better or that the medical treatment there is more advanced than abroad. So he went back. Although seemingly in a free environment, many Chinese students studying abroad still hang out with friends from their home country and read news from Chinese state-controlled media. They may very likely still fall for propaganda from the communist regime. Even though he went abroad, his mind stayed inside China, under the Communist Party's domination. That is to say, his physical self is outside the wall, but his inner spirit stayed inside. For little pinks like him who are studying abroad, it's a common phenomenon. Gu said the student from Wuhan isn't able to see the Communist Party's true nature. So he couldn't make a rational judgment about what he should do during the pandemic, which impacted his life and his future. Reporting by Juliet Song, NTD News, New York. The ongoing pandemic has brought America's dependence on China for medical supplies into the spotlight. One of the uh, things that this crisis has taught us, sir, is that we are dangerously over-dependent on a global supply chain for our medicines, like penicillin, our medical supplies, like masks, and our medical equipment, like ventilators. According to a recent congressional report, 30 percent of the U.S.'s personal protective equipment imports last year came from China. Similarly, 80 percent of the basic components used in U.S. drugs come from China and India. But 80 percent of the key ingredients for India's genetic drug manufacturers are also sourced from China. So how did we become so reliant on China? Many world leaders argue letting it into the WTO was an important turning point. Plus, the agency couldn't have done it without the U.S.'s backing. The U.S. played an indispensable role in bringing about China's WTO accession. And WTO accession was rocket fuel for PRC's ambitions, giving it the global market access that turned China into the world's manufacturing and export powerhouse. No policy has strengthened the PRC more. In the late 1970s, the communist regime began to loosen control of the Chinese economy, basing its legitimacy and power on economic growth. The regime was eager to expand foreign market access and join the rulemaking body for international trade. The WTO is a membership organization. To get in, China had to be accepted by all members, but most importantly, had to cut a deal with the U.S. President Carter first granted China most favored nation status in 1979, but the label had to be reviewed annually based on human rights records and other concerns. In April 1990, then-Chinese Premier Zhu Rongji took a five-day road trip through the U.S., pitching the Chinese market to corporate America. Under pressure from the business community, President Clinton started trade talks with China. The ongoing talks were derailed by the Chinese embassy bombing in Belgrade. According to a Wall Street Journal report, the White House sent California Senator Dianne Feinstein to deliver a handwritten message from President Clinton to Chinese President Jiang Zemin, urging him to resume talks. One month later, the talks resumed. Later that year, on November 15th, the two nations signed a bilateral agreement. In it, China promised to reduce tariffs and trade barriers. In return, the U.S. would support China's entry into the WTO. This removed China's biggest hurdle in becoming a member. Several months later, the China trade bill was sent to Congress. Labor unions opposed it, fearing competition from cheap Chinese labor. Rights advocates raised similar concerns and wanted the annual reviews of the country to continue. But China's membership was championed and heavily lobbied for by big businesses eyeing the 1.2 billion consumers in its market. As then U.S.-China Business Council President Robert Capp said, it would bring billions of dollars to American businesses. It was eventually passed and signed into law by President Clinton in October 2000. The move granted Beijing permanent trade relations, removed the annual review and paved the way for China's WTO accession the next year. Clinton called it a good day for America after signing the bill. He added that in 10 years from now, we will look back on this day and be glad we did this. But 10 years later, that wasn't what had happened. Judging by the expressions of the past 10 years, 
I think the answer to the first question, whether China has and will keep its promises, is sadly no. The level playing field promise as part of WTO's ascension has not arrived. WTO membership has resulted in a massive shift of jobs and wealth from the United States to China, which has come again at a huge cost to us. Just in the few months following President Clinton's approval, over 80 companies announced plans to move production to China. The corporations were mostly multinational. With foreign investment and factory jobs flooding in, China's exports and economy boomed. Since 2000, China's GDP grew nearly four times as large. During the same period, the U.S.'s trade deficit with China also quadrupled, going from $84 billion in 2000 to nearly $420 billion in 2018. World Trade Organization, which created China. China has been like a rocket ship ever since. With production shifted to China, jobs went there too. According to a recent study from the Economic Policy Institute, the deficits with China cost 3.7 million U.S. jobs between 2001 and 2018. That's because the imports represent products that otherwise would have been made by American workers. Also lost to China, America's own capacity to make medicine. You know, we're so dependent that... Uh, we can't even make antibiotics anymore in the United States. That began in the early 2000s when the United States opened up free trade with China and the last penicillin plant shut down, the last vitamin C plant shut down. And that happened because China undercut others' uh, companies on price and kept prices low for a long time. These are illegal trade practices. In a 2018 report, the U.S. Trade Representative's office said the U.S. made a mistake supporting China's entry into the WTO. Now, in the face of the pandemic and the CCP's cover-up, the U.S. is reminded again, despite its best hope, that the Chinese communist regime cannot be trusted. Hong Kong police stormed a shopping mall today. They used pepper spray to disperse pro-democracy protesters who had gathered for a sing-along protest. The demonstrators chanted Free Hong Kong Revolution of Our Times in the Sha Tin's New Town Plaza Mall. It's a place where police and protesters have clashed before. Riot police sprayed tear gas to disperse the crowd, then cordoned off the area. Police said protesters were violating social distancing rules. But activists say they are fighting to protect the one country, two system style of governance, which guarantees freedoms for Hong Kong after its return to China in 1997. Earlier in the day, long lines formed outside pro-democracy or yellow businesses. It was part of a May Day campaign to show support for the protest. The yellow economic circle contrasts with the blue businesses which are deemed pro-government. The campaign to shop yellow is a way for people to peacefully support the protest movement. Friday's protests were the latest in a string of demonstrations over the past week. And in the UK, wariness towards the Chinese regime continues to mount. Some lawmakers are concerned the CCP is trying to bolster its image amid the pandemic. Our UK correspondent Jane Wirrell has more. The Chinese regime's handling of the pandemic has shown it plays by authoritarian rules. The chair of the UK's Defence Committee says it seems the Chinese state is trying to bolster its image after covering up the outbreak and concealing data. I'm now concerned that they're actually using the absolute global demand for personal protective equipment, which they produce um, in large numbers, uh, to create another equivalent of the One Belt, One Road, but a, but a health silk road. But the CCP's efforts to rebrand themselves amid the crisis hasn't always worked. Many European countries have complained about faulty Chinese-made equipment, and wariness of the Chinese state is growing among many senior lawmakers. The West needs to be more determined in, in recognising what it stands for, what it believes in, what it defends. Everybody I think, thought this might be the end of President Xi, but he's managed to turn this around to his own advantage. He's, he's illustrating as if he's tamed this virus uh, by producing these numbers which simply don't add up. The EU's foreign policy chief has warned of a battle of narratives during the pandemic, saying China is aggressively pushing the message that, unlike the US, it is a responsible and reliable partner. The UK's Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab has said that it won't be business as usual with China after the crisis. Jane Wirrell, NTD News, London.
Europeans are increasingly wary of being at the mercy of China for medical supplies. A member of the German parliament makes a case for reducing economic dependence on China. British medical doctors are warning that hundreds of ventilators from China could kill virus patients. In a Thursday NBC report, the doctor said the machines are faulty and unsuitable. The pandemic has prompted many in Europe to reflect on how they got into this mess and for the EU to revisit its trade relationship with China. For some, it's important to understand how the regime works. I grew up in the communist part of Germany, so I know the rules of the game in communist systems very well. Since March, many European governments have struggled to buy medical equipment, like masks and testing kits, to fill up large gaps in their supply. And they often had to rely on China. It exports a quarter of the world's masks. Some of these Chinese-made products are faulty or unsuitable. In mid-April, a German company found 11 million masks they had bought from China were unusable. We have to ensure that we do not remain this dependent on China. Prices alone cannot regulate such a thing. Then we are walking into a trap. After China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, it gradually established its domination of crucial supply chains, including medical goods and drugs. China now provides up to 90 percent of the world's active ingredients for antibiotics. Many are concerned about the leverage the CCP has on countries' healthcare systems. It would be the worst thing if China one day says, so, and if you don't do as we wish, we won't supply you anymore. We must not be naive and blind and ignore the dangers that are always associated with dealing with a dictatorship. Prompted by the crisis, many in Europe are seeing more clearly the risks that come with economic dependence on China. Two weeks ago, EU trade ministers agreed it was important to diversify Europe's production processes to reduce the reliance on individual countries of supply. In Europe, we will need to strive for a different kind of production and supply. That means self-sufficiency with essential goods, even if it's more expensive. But then we know what we've got. We cannot be blackmailed with it. We cannot get into an emergency situation. Some in Europe see the risks and downsides start to outweigh the economic opportunities from investing in China. Europe has reduced its share in manufacturing exports since integrating trade with China. European companies still face significant barriers in accessing the Chinese market, and many who are already there, like BMW, have seen only stagnating revenue growth. Analysts at the Mercator Institute for China Studies argue that China is just as dependent on Europe and that the EU should leverage its economic power in dealing with the CCP. Reporting by Christian Watchen, NTD News, Berlin. A new executive order is signed in the White House, this one aimed at protecting the U.S. electricity system from cyber attacks. That's according to the Department of Energy. In a move to help protect the power grid in the U.S., President Trump signed an executive order on Friday. The order seeks to secure our electricity system against cyber attacks by foreign threats. According to Energy Secretary Dan Brouillette, the action will make it much harder for foreign adversaries to target the U.S.'s critical infrastructure. The power grid not only delivers electricity to homes and businesses, but also supports the military and emergency systems. A senior Energy Department official said that the order wasn't directed at any specific threat. Instead, it's the result of an effort to strengthen the power system. The Energy Department says government rules about buying equipment for the power grid often result in contracts being awarded to the lowest cost bids, which it says can be exploited. Trump's executive order prohibits purchases, imports or transfer of power equipment if U.S. officials think the transactions may be influenced by a foreign adversary. The 2019 Worldwide Threat Assessment issued by then U.S. Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats reported that China, Russia and other countries were using cyber techniques to spy on U.S. infrastructure. The majority of the nation is in recovery mode, as around 20 states are loosening restrictions and reopening today. And Texas is using up even more. Still, a handful of states are buckling down for the coming weeks. The nation's CCP virus cases well over 1 million, more than 60,000 deaths and 150,000 recoveries. States are forging ahead with economic recovery. Texas, among the first to reopen, is moving further today, opening restaurants, malls, and movie theaters. Iowa is among a number of states taking steps towards normalcy today, despite being one of the few states that never ordered people to stay home. Today in 77 counties with low or no virus activity, restaurants, fitness centers, retail stores, and closed malls may reopen at 50 percent 
of normal operating capacity. Similar happenings today in North Dakota, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. The vast majority of the nation is headed towards economic recovery, leaving 12 states still shuttered. But even among those with extended stay-at-home orders, some are loosening up on businesses. Like Maine, whose stay-at-home order is extended to the end of May, but businesses like barbershops and nail salons can reopen today, while some embrace tighter restrictions, like California. Tighten that up a little bit, and so we're going to have a temporary pause on, on the beaches down there. But some residents refuse to adhere to the strict measures. Local reports say a sparsely populated California county is moving ahead with reopening despite Newsom's order. But in other popular tourist locations, like in Las Vegas, some residents aren't as eager for restrictions to ease up. If I go back too early, I won't be able to be alive to work. We'll live in a wonderful country and I take their word and they're helping us. So. That's amid Nevada's substantial economic blow. One economic researcher says the unemployment rate for the state resembles that of the Great Depression. Melina Weiskup, NTD News. Others are set to loosen restrictions on Monday, making 38 states headed towards economic recovery. And a makeshift hospital in Spain closed today. The European country is at the beginning of a four-phase reopening plan. A makeshift hospital in Madrid closed today as all patients were discharged. Spain is in the first of a four-phase plan to lift its lockdown. The country plans to be fully back to normal at the end of June. Italy is planning to gradually ease lockdown measures starting May 4th. But social distancing must stay in place for now. Beach operators are thinking about introducing an obligatory reservation system to reduce crowding. Britain's housing minister says the UK may have hit its daily target of 100,000 virus tests. Health Minister Matt Hancock originally announced the target after coming under heavy criticism for moving too slowly. In Vienna, protesters demonstrate against future lockdown measures. Some of them cite the Austrian government's plan to restrict travel until a vaccine is discovered. The country is also working on a mandatory tracking app for its citizens, another future measure at the heart of the protests. Meanwhile, Austria reopened DIY stores, shops and hairdressers today. Lufthansa tries to keep its autonomy while it gets bailout money from the German government. U.S. lawmakers are probing carnival cruises over massive CCP virus outbreaks on its ships. And more in business news. Lufthansa's chief executive warned against government interference in the airline's management as it seeks a bailout worth almost $10 billion. The group is trying to avoid bankruptcy due to the CCP virus pandemic while also keeping its autonomy. Travel bans forced Lufthansa to ground 700 of its aircraft, causing a 99% drop in passenger numbers. Germany could end up taking a 25.1% stake in the airline as part of the bailout. Carnival Cruises was told to hand over documents related to CCP virus outbreaks on board. The U.S. House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure requested the materials. The committee wants to find out the details of the cruise line's response to over 1,500 CCP virus infections on its ships. At least 39 people have died after contracting the virus on its ships. The committee says Carnival has not put enough safeguards in place despite the problems. A letter accuses the company of ignoring the public health crisis. Oil prices rise as OPEC Plus begins record production cuts. U.S. oil prices rose by almost 17 percent. The cuts were agreed upon in April after an oil production war by Russia and Saudi Arabia put too much oil on the market and helped wreck prices, along with a global drop in demand from the CCP virus pandemic. If you have to wear a mask in public, why not do it in style? Disney is offering some fun options. Disney is introducing non-medical face masks featuring some of its most popular characters, including Mickey and Minnie Mouse, Anna and Elsa, Woody and Buzz Lightyear, The Avengers, R2-D2, and The Mandalorian, character people call Baby Yoda. They cost $19.99 for a four-pack and are available for pre-sale at the Shop Disney website. Disney is donating all profits from U.S. sales of the masks up to a million dollars to the nonprofit group MedShare until September 30th. Disney is also donating a million of the masks for kids and families in underserved and vulnerable communities across the United States. Here at China In Focus, we dedicate ourselves to bringing you truthful, unbiased reporting. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates and see you next time.